Hello and welcome to Marxism Today. Today's episode is about technology and the question, does technology create value? We discuss this as well as ways that a socialist society could accommodate payment for post-scarcity commodities, especially those in the realm of media. Enjoy. All right, so what's the next topic? Do machines create value? Is value defined as, as s- production, as something being created? You're already headed to the right place, which is like, what is value? If we're going to say if a machine creates value, we need to define value. And machine and creates. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. Let's get started. We have a lot of work. No, but yeah, yeah what, is, what would you say? Yeah. The first distinction we need to make, since we're going to be Marxist about this, is... The distinction between use value and exchange value. A machine clearly has use value, and many machines can create new use values. Like, I don't know, a machine that makes a car, that car has its own use value. Mm. But then there's also exchange value, which means it it's saleable, you can sell it. I think for when it comes to use values, it's an unequivocal yes. Like, the machine clearly can make use values. So then the next question is, can a machine make an exchange value? In other words, can they make value that you can sell? Yes. I guess. I yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah. Like, I think we can think of some examples. What comes to mind where a machine has produced value that you can sell? Well, would the car be an example still, again, of yeah. that one too? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Any sort of agricultural machinery. Although... Mm. I guess here's the question, or here's the question I should, before throwing that one out, are we talking autonomous machinery or machinery that requires a direct human control? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. I think it applies just to a different extent for both of those two categories, but to make it simple for means of conversation, let's talk about a fully automated machine. Okay. I, for a machine that requires human input, we could say that we're also talking about that, but restricting to the part of it that does not require the human input or, or the, the part that is not provided by the human. You, you know, you can probably think of or imagine at least a factory that's completely automated. Car assembly or, or, uh, you know, sometimes bottling plants are all automated or whatever. There's probably lots of them that we sure. don't even know about. Yeah. Agricultural stuff sometimes can be automated to a large extent, if not fully. So those, those create, values that can be exchanged but then here's my question to you imagine that you can buy all the pieces of a car and assemble them yourself for cheaper than it costs to buy the car pre-assembled okay right so that that would be the value added by the assembly machine right mm-hmm. the the difference in the cost between the parts and probably you can't really in <laughs> in reality cuz like How dare you? they they charge you more for the parts oh, yeah. like just oh, yeah. as they can but let, let's for the sake of argument say that there's a difference between those two and the difference is the value added by the car assembly machine what if everyone had a car assembly machine or one that you could easily use for free would then value really be added by it? Like, would would you pay a higher price for the already assembled car? Right, no. Yeah. So then, once... I mean, and, and let's do another example where, where the technology is spread freely. Where uh, making a copy of an MP3, mm-hmm. something that we can all... Like, as long as we have the MP3, let's say the original one is freely available but making a duplicate of that file. That's something we can all do with our computers. Does that create any value? Well, I would say say maybe not, but only because the MP3 is different than the car, because the car is material, and the MP3 can be reproduced indefinitely, you know? Yeah. So it's, like, infinite. It, It just... So... Well, there is a slight physical limitation, because it is held... 
as charges and magnetic charges sure. and stuff. But in a practical sense, I mean, you yeah. can you can With just continue. Virtually no value. Maybe. You can continue to yeah. duplicate it in in such a way that it basically yeah, yeah is infinite. But I think that's partially because a software thing then is somewhat post scarcity. Right. We're talking about a post scarcity product when we're talking about a, a just a, a file. But when we were talking about the car, we that would not be a post scarcity product. But the part of it that is fully automated, if we imagine that automation being freely available to everyone, mm-hmm. that everyone has access to that technology and has that technology, then we said you probably wouldn't pay more for it. Right. right. So in that case, we it's not even a post scarcity commodity. Mm-hmm. It's the, the the car still has value, but it but it's not none of it was added by that fully mm-hmm. automated portion of it. Yeah. Right. This is exactly where I wanted to go with this because this is something uh, I've been kind of struggling with a little bit because the standard Marxist answer, right? Like if you read Orthodox Marxist take on this is that machines do not create value because Marx stuck with the labor theory of value, okay. which was not a theory of value that he created. It actually was around before him. Capitalist, pro-capitalist economics, okay. classical economics, invented this theory before Marx. And I've always felt it, it's been something that since Marx agreed to it, capitalist economists have changed their mind on it and decided to attack Marx on the ground of the labor theory of value, saying that it is not labor that creates value, or at the very a weaker stance, it's not the only thing, but, but many of them say it's not labor at all. So the question, if, if we're going to agree to the labor theory of value, then we have to say machines create no value. But my initial thought is, well, of course they create value, but maybe it was because I was thinking of use value, not exchange value, but then I could think of, well, like the car assembly plant, if I don't have access to that technology, mm-hmm. then it does seem to create value because they can sell it for a greater amount. So that seemed like a contradiction. And, and to, for the record, I think there are ways to be a Marxist even if you don't believe in the labor theory of value. But I think I have convinced myself of it. And and this this is this is kind of why like the distinction there was because we had a difference when the technology was freely accessible versus when it was not accessible to us when it was only a, a capitalist or a small group of people that had it. So the difference was not in the machine. The machine could be the exact same machine in both cases, does the exact same thing in both cases. It's a question of access to that thing, which is actually very similar to land. To have a factory someplace, you need to have some land to put it somewhere. Mm-hmm. And the landlord is able to get money from that land, it's, you know, in, in, in rent. They receive value. But does the land sitting there create the value? So we, we have lots of instances in our economy where someone receives value but not because they or the thing they own has even created it. It's only because the thing they own is a necessary component, but not necessarily one that creates the value. It's because they have exclusive rights Mm -hmm. for that thing. And a lot of economists, not even Marxist economists, will call all things like that a rent, which I think can be confusing for reasons, but we'll go with it, rent. So land is sort of a rent, same thing actually happens with money. If so, if you need a certain amount of money to start something off, you have to borrow it from somebody that has it because not you don't have access to it. And then you have to pay that person interest, which is essentially a rent on the fact that they have a necessary component that you need. People also make this argument for things like Microsoft Word, mm-hmm. that... Yes, some of the value that we pay for buying Microsoft Word is the value that the programmers and and all the people that worked on making that product have done. But a large portion of it is also because because Microsoft has an exclusive right on this thing that we've all decided we need in order to write something on a computer. 
because it's easiest to have just one format and only one that fits, and it's a pain for people to have to learn a new word processor when they move from job to job. So we've all agreed on having that one platform, Microsoft Word, or many of us have. I know, yeah, <laughs> t- Tony's thinking of, exa- <laughs> of counterexamples in his head right now, I'm sure. Maybe. <laughs> but, but because of that, there's a certain amount of value that is provided to Microsoft simply because they own that concept. And I think, at first I didn't agree with this, but now I think I do, that basically when a new machine or a new technology is created, it's not the money that that, that accrues to the owner of that is not largely due to the actual value production of that thing, but rather on their exclusive claim Mm -hmm. to something that has become a necessary component of the production process. So monopoly rent. Yeah, yeah, a monopoly rent, exactly. It's something that I've been thinking about and kind of struggling with, but I Hmm. think I actually agree that machines do not create value... But but then but then you have to address the fact that people that have machines and sometimes only machines or hardly any employees, maybe just one employee running a huge machine, are able to get get as much money as someone who has a lot of employees but doesn't have hardly any machines. You know, like maybe like farming in the third world, or I don't know, I don't know what those industries are. Maybe a restaurant or something. <laughs> But you can have industries where a lot of people are employed and the versus where just one is employed, but there's a huge machine involved, and the rate of profit is the same across those, or, or can even be better for the one with the big machine. So the, the way to justify that, or the way to explain that is, I believe that that person is receiving a monopoly rent value or a value in the form of a monopoly rent that is not because they have created value. And that's why when you mention um, having the car assembly machine be all over the place, that's, that's why that's pertinent. Because if, it, if, it's all, if that guy, that one person with that giant machine, if that machine was all over the place, he wouldn't be making as much money necessarily as the company. Well, but my thought with that is, so if you have, everybody has a car assembly machine, versus um, just like some factories have it, then I see that it's tying into the, the socially necessary labor time component of labor theory of value because suddenly it's the when everybody has the machine, then the socially necessary labor time is ba- essentially none because there's no scarcity on the machines to build mm-hmm. it, whereas when there's not, there's more socially necessary labor time because you have a limited amount of supply production. Yeah, I mean, it fits right in with that's the labor that's the labor theory of value, right? Is yeah. the the value of something is how much labor it takes to put into it, and with the creation of a new machine, what we've done is that machine doesn't create value if no la- if virtually no or no labor is required, right? Just like how we said you can't charge more for it if everyone has that technology, but what it um, does do is change the use value. Like it, act, you can actually produce more output per labor hour, right? It like it changes the value of the end commodity. But here's an interesting take on this: if machines do not create value, and only human labor does, it means that when we automate an industry we are reducing the amount of value produced. Mm -hmm. Now, the same output can be produced, or even more output. You might be able to make more machines or more crops or more whatever. That's use values. But the overall value is reduced. Now, is it reduced for for that capitalist when they do it? Probably not, because they adopt the machine because no one else has it. Right, or they're adopting the machine because others have it and they don't, and they're behind, and they have to pay too much in labor costs. So that capitalist doesn't see a loss, but the old school Marxist argument is that that step of automation 
undermines the production of value in our economy as a whole, and therefore is one of the main Marxist theories of crisis. And that's usually why I didn't start in agreement with it, because it's really hard to see, to connect the dots, right, from people start using a bunch of machines to there will be a crisis. Because that seems counterintuitive, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we always, we almost always think mm -hmm. of a machine as going to help the situation of a crisis. But here, here's another way to get to that same conclusion, I think, that doesn't necessarily use the labor theory of value, but I think ties in nicely with it because it, it starts with the same beginning and comes to the same end. So that, that, I like that because it's, it's a theory that, is parallel but gets there through a different path. And and it's essentially I mean we've talked about this before in in our in some of our previous episodes but think about it this way in in the sense of the realization problem. If a whole bunch of industries all get rid of their labor force because they don't need it anymore mm -hmm. and have replaced it with machines That'll be great for them at that point, but what they've done is taken the overall demand for commodities across the entire economy and reduced it because those people that used to be earning a paycheck no longer are. Yeah. So they all hope that they are not the capitalist that will take the hit, you know, because it won't be spread evenly. Mm -hmm. It's not like every single commodity will see the same dip in what it is, but they hope that when they automate, they will not be the person who gets the brunt of the dip but that they are the person that can make the brunt of the savings or, or take the lion's share of the savings um, by getting rid of their labor force. So it, it, this, is, this is also a super interesting contradiction in the capitalist system because every individual capitalist's incentive is to do this. Reduce your labor force and, and get the most advanced automation because you can gain a monopoly rent from it. But overall, you undermine the ability of all other capitalists, in, including yourself even, to actually sell the products you produce. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense because, like, if, say, we automated, what did I say earlier, 50% or something? Like, if we automated 50% of the labor force, we would have a massive under consumption crisis you know we'd, we'd be able to produce a ton of commodities but we wouldn't be able to find find a place to sell them or or we'd have to export a lot of them which you know that that would be a whole thing but not uh, assuming every country did it then you wouldn't not, not everyone can be an exporting country <laughs> you'd have to sell them for a lot cheaper is what you'd have to do yeah. This will get get me off on a tangent, though. But I mean, when we talk about well, when we talk about, I've said this to you before in in conversations, but just that um, it, it's been from what I've read that technology has ushered in economic change in a lot of ways, and I think that this change, which is going to come, because you guys mm -hmm. talked about like uh, you know the the human Z not apply the video and yep, yep. and the loss of human uh, jobs due to automation. But I feel like that could be really bad for people, but it could also be a turning point where we have to rethink well, how we define value mm -hmm. and how how much things are worth. And and if things are suddenly, if you couldn't sell them, you'd have to sell them for cheaper. And suddenly you'd realize, oh, okay, we just don't need as much money, but we still have all these things. Maybe you don't need to work as much. Maybe that's a pipe dream. Maybe that's the best possible scenario. And maybe it's optimistic, but that's how it makes me feel. Well, yeah, I, I think the crux of the matter is producing use values with very little labor is an objectively good thing. The question is, you know, it does this spell the end of capitalism? Mm -hmm. And possibly, I mean, if the, the technological innovation doesn't necessarily, but the end of human labor, I think, right. does. Because capitalism require, requires the production of values and, and, and the selling of those so, values. Someone in needs order. to buy it, yeah. Exactly. So if you imagine a fully automated society... Either it has to be non-capitalist because the people are receiving output from those from that automation that they don't own, mm -hmm. where where you just produce things for almost no cost and then distribute them for also no no or little cost, or you have to imagine that 
the capitalist cap- class just ditches the working class. They all starve, and the capitalist class just amasses outrageous amounts of all commodities just for themselves, <laughs> which is also like a weird thing because capitalists aren't really concerned about gathering use values. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the main one of the main distinctions that going back to Marx with wow. the you know someone who cares about use values spends their money on the thing they like. Whether it's fine wines or, you know, they collect motorcycles or whatever, they care about use values. That means they spend their money. A capitalist cares about exchange value, which means he invests his money. And and so gathering a whole bunch of use values, I mean, maybe they could just shift and want to have more use, more and more mm. use values. But even then, I mean, the, I, I, that, that wouldn't really be a capitalist society either. It would be, you know a huge die-off of the human race to only a few (laughs) left. But those few left, the capitalists that are left, wouldn't be able to... You can't be a capitalist if you're not employing other people and selling things. Like, either way, it's the the system doesn't work. Well, there is a way, a different option, though, that does exist, and that is it becomes cheaper instead of just automating everything to offshore everything to where the labor force is so much cheaper than it is even to mechanize. That exists, and I mean, I think still you'll end up butting heads with the same problem because as then, you know, say China and Taiwan and Vietnam and all these places that do a lot of stuff, they start to get more money there, then those people start to demand more, and then their standard of living goes up, so... I don't think that can be passed around indefinitely like that, but... Right, yeah. One thing that you touched on a little bit is the idea of moving to a higher rate of exploitation. Like, that's one thing that, that a capitalist class could do as a class to offset the oncoming crisis caused by automation. And and this is this usually gets called the countervailing tendencies right. of this particular crisis theory. And and this is one of them, and I think Thad was actually touching on a little bit earlier too, where the fact that we have automation almost always means that that commodity is cheaper, especially if you have an under-consumption crisis. Like, it just needs to be in order because you want to recover at least some money for that commodity. So almost always they become cheaper. Well, if that happens over and over again, With all these different commodities, especially the commodities that the working class needs to reproduce itself, you can actually give the working class the same life that they had before, but have a higher rate of exploitation. Mm. Because the cost of those things is so much less, but an hour of their work produces so much more value. That helps a capitalist avoid the, the crisis because one of the side effects of the thing that causes the crisis is also the thing that allows them to gain more value from their working class. Well, that was the, that was my line of thought earlier, was the, the reason why this crisis is also scary in a way is if 50% of the, the labor force suddenly didn't have a job. I, I feel like, it was taking a step back, I feel like a lot of social reform doesn't take place because people are sort of placated. I mean, we have a lot. We have a lot in this country, and it's very easy to sort of be apathetic because of it, because we're, we're rich. Even some of the poorer of us, we're rich compared to the relative scale of the pl- of the other people on the planet. Mm-hmm. It's easy to be comfortable or think that you're getting somewhere w- w- and you're not. But when if suddenly half of us just didn't have a job through through no fault of our own, people would probably revolt in a way. I mean, there would oh, yeah. be there a would huge be upset. A massive change. Well, and it could be good or bad. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the kind of thing that or has... good, then bad, then good, then bad, then worse. And yeah. you talk about it... Um, Capitalism being ingeniously designed to sort to to placate um, people to even to to um, package rebelliousness to package anger and sell it back to people and this is sort of a weird way that it could even within the the mechanism of capitalism to continue to do that continue to give the people what they at least what they had before to make them a little bit more passive. 
because if they don't oh, lose yeah. that stuff, and that's interesting, like that is a a a darker version of that where things don't co- completely collapse, but there's a greater divide of wealth because yeah. every you still have the same you have you have so many machines making so much more, but it's still going the bottom the bottom tier still is getting just as much as they used to yep while while the overall production overall value in society grows and grows and grows and becomes more and more concentrated yeah what supports and, that is that there's precedence for that that's what's been happening i mean yeah. in the last decades i mean the, this is very believable and it actually ties back into thomas piketty's book that we were talking about capital in the 21st century one of his findings is the normal functioning of capitalism is to create massive divides between the working class and the capitalist class, and a growing divide, I should say, not just a massive divide, but a continually widening gap. I I think part of the problem with a crisis from automation happening is that capitalist economic theory basically doesn't admit of crises. Yep. I mean, Keynesian does a little bit, but I think that a crisis like that partially comes about just from their lack of understanding of the system itself. Yep. I would like to shift now to the idea of software, because software is particularly interesting. And actually, I kind of want to open up software. Maybe a better term would be a knowledge commodity. In other words, we have a lot of things in our world today that are not physical commodities. And what they are is basically some form of knowledge. For many softwares, it's directions for a machine to follow, like a computer. And and this is something that, I mean, that's been around. It's just a new technique of doing a thing. If there was a faster way to cobble a shoe, that used to be something that existed. But it was just sort of like a given free thing. More and more, our economy does not assume the the societal knowledge as a given. It is now an input or a commodity or something that commands value in the market. That lends itself to an interesting position because of a couple of qualities of a knowledge commodity. One of those qualities would be that it's easily reproducible. That's kind of what you were getting at when you talked about a post-scarcity commodity. Knowledge commodities fall into that category of post-scarcity. Once you have produced a piece of knowledge, reproducing that piece of knowledge is very easy whether it be a book or a song or an mp3 or even a software program to make a copy of that and send it along is very cheap. And because a knowledge commodity is the tip of an iceberg and the bottom part of the iceberg is all of the other social knowledge that's been developed up to that point, which are oftentimes basically free inputs for it. When a new piece of software comes out, There's all of this programming language and schooling and blah, blah, blah. There's all of this stuff that was provided free by society that led up to that new piece of software. And that new piece of software is just the icing on the cake, but it commands the full market value for that thing without the societal contribution subtracted from it. So you're saying it is worth... The whole iceberg, not just the tip? Is that what you're saying, or are you saying the other way around, that it's not worth it? Let's for a moment say that it is worth. The value there is, in fact, worth the entire iceberg. Everything all society put into all the factors that made that software. It's worth that. Okay. Let's say that. Okay. Then the value gained by it, if we're going to be fair about it you would need to direct some of that value back to the inputs from it Mm -hmm. that were gained for free. Sounds like they deserve it, yeah. Yeah, like, uh, you know, and and this is something that you didn't have to worry about with a physical commodity, right? Like, if I sew overcoats, you know, I get fabric from someone to sew these overcoats, I need to pay that person for that fabric. Or if I assemble cars, I need to pay someone for that steel or whatever. With physical commodities, you always pay for the inputs, so that delivery of value to the institutions and people that provided that value is there. With a knowledge-based commodity, it's not there. With a knowledge-based economy, I think I follow, but with the other ones, those people still have to learn how to sew that overcoat. That was always 
something that should not be included in the value of it. Mm -hmm. Which is the other way to take it. Which is to say, this new piece of software is worth the the top part of the iceberg, the value that's been put into it on top of what society has all already provided. Uh-huh. You know, the critique would be, but in the market today, they are commanding the value of the entire iceberg, which is more than the value than, that they have made. Right. Well, it's because they manipulate the markets. It's, but with software, it's what they do. Virtually uh, post-scarcity with, when it comes to software. So what they do is... If you want to use the software to make sure you pay for it, you need to use a CD key or you need to log in so we can verify that this is correct. Tech support is what comes to mind. Normally you have to pay to get some sort of tech support, and that's a knowledge thing. So I think mm-hmm. they, they put barriers to inflate the value perhaps from what it should be, which is relatively minor, depending, to be more because they're able to put these barriers in place. They're essentially trying to reinforce the old format of a commodity because we haven't come up with a new reimbursement mechanism that fits the new form of commodity we've created. Right. Which is, which is a, a fault, obviously, of capitalism. In a socialist society, I mean, you just automatically have a mechanism to have it returned to the, the bottom half of the iceberg, right? Y- yeah. There are lots of ways that socialists could come up with to have a different mechanism. Mm -hmm. I remember actually sitting down and thinking one through once, like just of my own, you know, because I was kind of interested in the issue, especially from like a music perspective, right? So in downloading music, how should that work? And, you know, maybe probably there's lots of socialists out there that would disagree with me on this stance, but this is how I think it should work. You can go ahead and put music that your group has, has created onto this database where everyone can download it for free. And ev- everyone that uses this service is, is taxed in a way, or maybe everyone is taxed, but there's some tax, right? Some, some social value that's put into this big group. And depending on how many downloads your thing receives, I'm sure that's a- able to be tracked, you get a small portion of that money. Mm-hmm. So if you create awful songs that no one downloads... Well, it turns out you don't get anything because that's uh, that's I wouldn't want to have like state chosen artists <laughs> where the, the like a government bureaucrat gets to choose all of the artists and that's the only music that gets produced or at least the only ones that are mm-hmm. um, paid to do what they do. So I still like the fact that people get to choose and that you, you are paid based on the popularity of of your item. I think that's great, but I would max it at a certain amount to be an artist. You can make whatever, six times the average income rate, and then we'll max you off at that or something like that. Because if we don't, then we either have to tax more or other or all the other artists get less. Right. So, like, to make sure that you have a wide group of artists, you know. Yeah. And blah, I'm blah, guessing blah. that... But there still can be arguments over, like, okay, how much should the tax be? You know, should we charge everyone another dollar this year and have more artists, you know, support mm-hmm. more artists? Or should we cut it in half and, you know... All the artists receive half of what they used to get, and I'm guessing that this average that you're talking about of what the peop- of people make is is enough to live comfortably. Like you don't have to work. So anything over that is just is cherry. Like it, it's not. Yeah. So it you it's uh it's you don't you don't have to feel bad about capping them off at six times that because that the, seems like a lot. Yeah, I mean six times is a that's also a number that could sure, be argued right. over. Yeah, and I don't mean of the average reimbursement per musician because I imagine there will be a lot of just hobby musicians that are making basically nothing off of it. Right. But the average rate of, of whatever, whole, you know, we keep con- track of that yeah. number already. You can look up what the median income is for every city and for the U.S. Sure. as a whole and all that. Yeah. So... That that's kind of my thought, and you know, if if we wanted to be more egalitarian, it could be less than six, or if we wanted to have more differentiation, it could be greater than six. The differentiation we have in society from the average is huge right now. Like oh, six absolutely. is nothing compared yeah. to what what major recording artists get. So, but but I like what you're thinking about because you're thinking about a tool to allow people to have a voice, and then also be incentivized to cre- like 
to create good music and and be out like to listen to that voice. So people get to vote and they they or they get to vote by their downloads. But essentially, people get to vote mm-hmm. about what they like, and then you do get rewarded for that. Based yeah. and and so you do want to have some tool there. But obviously, uh, a free market tool just is. I mean, like you said, it's so much. It it is more than really what the music becomes worth mm-hmm. at a certain point. So much more. Yeah. Well, and I think to Tony's point earlier about how downloads have been shown not to hurt recording industry profits. Piracy I, downloads, yeah. Yeah, a piracy downloads. Uh, I, and I think, it, I think it's because of this core reason. If you weren't going to buy it in the first place, right. then it doesn't make a difference whether you download it or not for, for that capitalist. They receive the same amount of money whether you decide not to buy it or you down, pirate it and for free. So... The, the takeaway there is that once it's produced, to have one person download it versus a million people or whatever, a billion people download it, it costs the same. So the one thing that I like about the, the particular system that I have, it's not like a penny per song or whatever. You can download as much as you want. So there's no, there's no limit. If you want to have more music, you just go get more music because it, it embraces the post-scarcity qualities of that oh, yeah. commodity which is what right now especially in media you talk about music and you music's always on the forefront of these changes but like now we see that piracy of video games of movies and tv yeah. that's a that's big and it's it's it, when it comes um to the media like that no but yeah i mean those they could fit the same format yeah yeah yeah, because once you've produced a movie, even though music is cheap to produce, I mean, you can right. sit down and record. And that's usually why it's on the forefront, because because it is so, and it, it is, it's very grassroots often, too, like, it's it's like that, yeah. But the same thing qualifies for a movie in the sense that once it's been produced, the fact, mm. what, the cost of one person seeing it versus the yeah. cost of everyone on the planet seeing it is, is yeah. the same. That's what I was going to say, actually, is that it, in in other media, that you can see that now that the industry's fighting against that, where they don't... They had a... With, like, cable TV, they had such a, a barrier, a paywall, to get... Like, you... Had to, had to pay for everything. Like you had to pay one thing, and they to get anything, mm-hmm. right? Now you, you pay this one, probably very low tax, and you have access to whatever you want. You can you can just take this one thing, and it's the and it's it's very cheap, and you can get that. But if it, if it's low enough, if that paywall is so low, and the amount you can receive is so high, it's it. They want to fight against that because they want to charge you for every tiny little thing, and they want to they want to make sure that they retain. That they're entrenched in that in that in those profit margins, but mm-hmm. technology is going to push it the other way, and and it is, and that's why that's why your idea works really well is that you're not paying per song, you're not paying per movie. You like Netflix works very well, mm-hmm. uh, and this is one of the reasons why they allow. And if if Netflix had, you know, uh, ten thousand times the amount uh, in, of the library that they currently own. It would be. I mean, it would yeah, be. It would every, be perfect. See, that's the thing: is that everything should be on this. You know, yeah. it's free to put something on it, and then if people download it, you get the money. So, as a artist, there's all the incentive in the world to put your your stuff on there. Yeah. So you might as well. I mean, unless I guess you wanted to try to sell it as as the old school commodity and make like tapes or something that people couldn't. I mean, actually. I guess you'd have to make like vinyl because people can record, can copy a tape or a oh, CD yeah. or mm-hmm. what a vinyl you'd have to like they put a microphone it, next a to it and then like yeah hit they, record. They have them. They exist where you you pour like a polymer or wax on it and then you pull it off and you have a mold oh. and then you create your own. Yeah, yeah. I think that's how they used to. See? You could also just rip them to like an MP3 file as well, like yeah. play them and plug them into your computer. Um, but. That you made me think of something talking about the if you know Netflix's library was way larger. Uh-huh. That that is always the complaint. There a complaint that I see a lot about a lot of stuff is that people say, "I would pay a hundred dollars a month if I could just watch whatever." If that was my media tax, yeah. if that was my entertainment for yeah. sure, and I got access to everything, I yeah. probably would too. Like I, I think that's interesting though because it's one of those things that there is a market for. But because it does not conform to mm-hmm. the way capitalist markets work, mm-hmm. it's a market that there's a demand for, but there's zero supply for in our society. Yeah.
This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Tony Schmidt and Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.